Hello, everybody. Welcome. I am beyond excited to introduce to you today, um, Erica Hess. I'm going to read her bio and then Erica, we're going to jump in. Awesome. Um, Erica is a painter, curator, and host of the podcast, I Like Your Work. Hess's work includes paintings and drawings about gender, motherhood, and the environment. She's represented by Contemporary Art Matters in Columbus, Ohio. Recent exhibition Exhibitions include Summer in the City, curated by Contemporary Art Matters, and an upcoming solo exhibition at Marietta College. Her work has been exhibited nationally, including New York City, Brooklyn, Detroit, LA, Boston, and Philadelphia. Her work has been featured in various publications, and she has served on panels such as Cleveland Institute of Arts, Feminism Now, Exposing the Truth, Boston University, Building Collaborative Art Spaces, and is a frequent lecturer. In addition to her artwork, Hess is an active juror and curator for various publications and institutions. Hess was a co-founder of Musa Collective, an artist collective in Boston, and is creator and host of I Like Your Work podcast, a podcast dedicated to interviewing artists, curators, and collectors, including people like myself. <laughs> she... <laughs> I love it. Um, she currently writes an art column for Art She Makes magazine. Um, and Erica got her MFA from Boston University. Like myself, she is basically my art twin. Um, <laughs> and I, I just want to say in a, on a personal level, um, I sort of learned about Erica's reputation before I actually knew her. I mean, we've actually, this is so crazy. We've never met in physical yeah. person, but we like overlap <laughs> in every conceivable way. And I'm, was at an art opening in Boston talking to all these people and they, no, people could not get enough of Erica. Just everybody had these wonderful things to say about you, Erica, because you are such a connector. Like people were talking about, I was talking to this group of very shy artists and they were like, Erica just makes things happen. She doesn't wait for things to come for her. She creates opportunities for other people. And she's just like a generous giver, connector, like let's lift all boats kind of an artist. And that is something I just have always loved about you, Erica. So, so, so much. You are just like generous in that, in that incredible way, like expanding the space for everybody. Um, and I just love that about you. So that is... <laughs> Welcome. Yeah, that, that is like the best <laughs> intro I've ever been given on any <laughs> podcast. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, it's just um, such a privilege to be here with you. And I'm excited for what you're creating for artists. And um, I love all those Aww. Boston artists that you're speaking of. And yeah, it's, it's just thank you for saying all of that. I genuinely do love supporting artists and creating spaces for people. I mean, let's, let's make something happen, right? Like let's help each other it. out. <laughs> I love it. Well, I think this is a big factor. I'm going to already throw out my first question and ask yeah. you something different because I feel, I just, I feel like you represent a quality in the art world that is the, the best possible quality, right? It's not, I'm going to sit in my studio and feel like moody about the fact that the world isn't knocking on my door, I'm going to go out and I'm going to create opportunity. And yes, this is going to benefit me. And that's awesome, but I'm going to bring other people along with me and I'm going to like actually widen the space for everybody. So I just, I think that's amazing. Um, and I, I, I feel like your project, I feel like your art, your curating, your podcast, all do these things for other people, even like the Musa Collective in Boston. So, uh, well, you know, one of the things I think about is what is life if you can't be hanging out with people you enjoy being around, right? Like mm. when, whenever I create an opportunity or create something, let's say, I want to include as many generous people, talented people, interested people, people who maybe haven't been given a chance before, but have a lot to offer um, a space, you know, because then it's not just some like check off another project, but it's something where you're building relationships and connections with other people, because at the end of the day, I mean, that's really what we have, right? Like that is yeah. what we have. Um, we can yeah. go curate a million shows, we can do all the things, but if you're not really creating something larger than that like what's the for me anyway what's the point you know so yeah um i really want to 
to create those spaces. And, you know, it's interesting. One of the first people I had on the podcast was um, Sharon Loudon. And I think she is an excellent artist to look at for generosity. And, you know, she kind of, yeah, she lit something up for me because she mentioned, um, you know, whenever you're given an opportunity, think of how you can open that opportunity up to others. And I was like, a light bulb went off. And I thought, that's right, you know, I don't have to just take what is given to me. Like you get this show or you get to do this. Like, okay, I would love that show. Can I have Hannah write about me? Or can I bring in Hannah's work? Or can I, you know what I mean? Thinking Mm -hmm. outside of the box as artists is what, what we're good at. And I think we need to implement it in those other areas. So, yeah. Yeah. I love that. I think it's, I think it's not just, I mean, it's smart, but it's smart in the best way. It's smart. It's generous. It's kind. And it makes the world you want to live in. I mean, it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about your work. Um, You you have all kinds of projects cooking, Erica, and we're going to get into those. But first, let's talk about your artwork. Um, Mm -hmm. You're a really interesting painter. Um, I had a deep dive on your website this morning. Will you tell me, um, will you talk to me a little bit about like, where it comes from what first, just for those people who have never seen it before, just what it looks like. Mm-hmm. Um, and tell me what kind of, what it's about for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think in order to really speak about my work, I have to give a little bit of my background, which is, you know, I was trained hey. from observation. I was, <laughs> I was the art student who you only had to take two figure drawing classes. And I signed up for one, like every single <laughs> semester. <laughs> I just nice. loved it. I, I loved working from observation and I thought I was going to be a figure painter. I thought I was going to go to Indiana university and do the whole like figure to painting thing. And um, I actually, I got into Indiana and I decided to take a year off and try for Boston University because I wanted, I wanted to challenge what I knew about art and what I could do with art. I felt like I was able to implement a narrative pretty clearly with a figure, but I didn't feel like my, I didn't feel like paint, like the material of paint was doing what it could in terms of kind of being like a a form of of writing or poetry or or expression you know like there's different Mm -hmm. ways to apply paint to create a different feeling from the viewer and that's where i wanted to be challenged and john walker i mean (laughs) who better to learn from than someone like him uh so that's when i decided to go you know, to Boston. And um, I started making like the figure disappeared out of my work. And I started making abstract paintings for quite a few years. And um, wow, yeah, working with with paint as a medium working with composition, and they were not wonderful paintings, they weren't terrible paintings, they're kind of great to look back on now. But I learned so much. And I was able to bring that forward into the work that I make now, uh, which mm-hmm. really brings together um, the the looking part, you know, looking at the world, thinking about the world, seeing how shadows are cast, you know, all of those beautiful small moments. Like I was walking this morning with my son and there was um, a sprinkler system going off with like the light streaming behind it. And I'm like, oh my God, that's a painting. How can I put that in a painting? It's beautiful. We like just stood there and watched it for a while, you know, and it was, it was really special. Um, So how do I bring, you know, like that type of thing to these inventive landscapes, which is what I'm creating now, these invented spaces. And Mm -hmm. these invented spaces, I I use a lot of color. I'm really interested in saturated, vibrant color, um, how that affects the emotional quality and tone of the piece. Um, So bringing that to these invented landscapes that really are centered on the idea of um, this shaped puddle in the center. And the shaped puddle in the center really responds to a lot of things that have happened to all of us over the pandemic in the past three years, because that's where the puddle series started. It started feeling overwhelmed. It started feeling like I couldn't do it all. It started in feeling actually coming out of postpartum depression where uh-huh. I literally felt like I was drowning. You know, I just, and, and I thought, yeah, wow, 
this idea of water, like it's so ingrained into our culture. I mean, it's talked about in, in various religious texts, you know, it's part of stories, the idea of water mm -hmm. as life and water as description towards our emotions. Um, so I just, I started running with that. And um, it's been about two years of making these water paintings, these puddle paintings, where I contain the puddle in the center and I try to push um, colors underneath and bring them back up. Mm -hmm. Like there's always this give and take and they're invented, a um, lot of texture. In order to talk about different psychological spaces that we inhabit, uh, mainly for women, um, I, you yeah. know, I'm a, I'm a cis woman and that is my experience. And so I try to bring it into my paintings. Um, also as a woman who has always been very motivated to um, work hard and achieve yeah. and have a career, you know, and to go into the art world and then also uh, decide to have children, you know, and how that can impact people's view of you and how you are, you know? So that's, that's kind of bringing it all together there. So there are women yeah. like you can see right now, I'm starting to paint this figure in the puddle. Um, so yeah, speaking wow. to all of those things. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. So there's so much, there's so much there and I want to dig in a little bit. <laughs> I, one of the things that really struck me looking at your work, Erica, is how in my, in my view, a, a great work of art has to be kind of of the medium, like the medium has to be appropriate for what you're making. Right. And when I look at your work, I'm like, oh my God, these have to be paintings. And, and that's like a marker of them being so good. And it's like, and I really notice that you are addressing feelings. Like, I think this is funny because in my sort of money work, I'm constantly talking about feelings and people are like, this isn't, <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk about feelings. I'm like, we have to talk about feelings or we yes. can't get beyond anything. Yes. And um, so I just wanted to just, I really want to dig into the being a mother and a painter with you. But first I want to talk about feelings. Like what, what is it about your work? Um, I, I, what is your relationship with that? Because I see it in the imagery, in the symbols, in the color, um, so uh, can you talk to me about the feelings? Yeah, yeah. So feelings are a huge motivator for my work and it's um, mm -hmm. intertwined in so many different levels. And, and what I find interesting about this discussion about feelings in work and also being a woman and being a painter and coming to age at a certain time in the world, you know, mm -hmm. is that there was a moment where like the idea of feelings in a painting, you know, was too feminine. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, couldn't help myself. <laughs> no, right? No, I love it. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and um, I think that these ridiculous, oh, I don't really want to say, it. I mean, like patriarchal, whatever umbrellas that we're all existing under, all they do mm -hmm. is limit everyone and you can't create anything interesting. Like, and it's meant to keep you in a certain spot. So anyway, um, I, I, I didn't want to paint feelings for a long time. And that was uh -huh. not a good place to be for someone who needs to be making work that way. Um, yeah. You know, this, this limitation that I placed on, placed on myself from others. And uh -huh. um, wait, let me just ask you when you were making those original abstract paintings that were kind mm -hmm. of a big surprise and shift for you back at BU, mm -hmm. were they trying to not have this in them? I don't know if I had the vocabulary for it yet to be okay. totally honest, you know, right. if I look back, I can see the stories and the feelings in it. But at that yeah. moment, I was just like, how do I figure out, I want to make paint do so much more. And I love painting. I love paint. Yeah. Like I am a painter and I had a certain mark that I had that I was like, how do I challenge this? So I got into like wet sanding and, you know, like using Galkit in there and this and brooms and, you know, just everything like, kitchen yeah. sink basically you know um and i think yeah there was actually a lot of feelings in that now that i'm saying it i never thought of it that way but yeah how can you how can you actually keep feelings out of a painting <laughs> right that, that is a really that is a really good point i mean i don't i i think there's a lot of feeling and emotion in art in all of the arts across yeah. the board really but at the same time i mean certainly 
BU in the era that you and I both were there, that was a very macho environment. And there was definitely a like, you got to try not to be a woman while you're there is how I felt. I don't know about you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't know. I feel like men are very emotional and we don't talk about that, but, uh, but people are always pointing out when women have feelings. Oh, I know. It was definitely, you know, used against women in writing and theory, all these things in like, Mm -hmm. I would say like seventies, eighties, I think it started to change a little bit. It's still prevalent, you know, but it's changing a bit, or maybe it's just like, we don't give a fuck. I'm like, all right, this is what I'm going to do. But, um, (laughs) (laughs) I like that. (laughs) Right. Um, but the feelings and idea that are coming out in my paintings now are much more nuanced. Mm-hmm. Just because I've had 20 years, you know, I'll be 40 this year, 20 years of of kind of making paintings and working with paint and living a life that wasn't always, you know, what you wanted it to be. Um, mm-hmm. And I think just, I really feel like the pandemic for me and feeling very alone and very sad in a lot of ways, like we all were. Yeah allowed me to push the work even more um also because we didn't have as many eyes on our work you know we weren't there weren't shows going on except online you know and and that allowed me to finally take um take the the deep dive into really exploring that i mean it also helped that i started um i started going to therapy and i think everybody should go to therapy i I, i've always been pro this and all of my friends say these things and i was always like yeah yeah therapy's great you know i i wasn't Mm -hmm. in it but being able to talk about the world at large the things that are happening and then the things that are happening personally um really allowed me to bring it even more into my paintings. Um, you know, I'm actually really interested in um, Jungian therapy, you know, working with symbols uh-huh. and I, you know, uh, color even, and the symbols that we've had as humans, you know, um, in all cultures, like wa- again, yeah. water as a symbol of the subconscious, the snake, you know, as a symbol, the sun, like these basic things have become a vocabulary for me to talk about what is going on in my life And I think they're just so core to many people that they can't help but see their story in it. And that's what I want. You know, I I want people to look at them and and be able to feel something as well. Oh, well, it's working. Um, (laughs) Great. That (laughs) that is it. (laughs) So talk to me about, um, I want to talk about um, just like that scary precipice of becoming a mother when you're a painter, especially, you know, I went to the same art school that you did. And, and so I assume that you have a little bit of the same kind of voices in your head, but I I remember being told some pretty insane things about how it was going to end my art career. And a woman couldn't really be creative once she had a baby. Someone said that to me. Um, so, um, a teacher, a teacher said Mm. that to me. Um, but uh, I'm just, so just tell me about how that landed with you. Cause, it, cause you are a mother, you've said it yourself. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, um, I felt that there were so many voices that were saying you couldn't be a serious artist in a mother, but never straight to my face, never straight out. It was always suggested in this sideways mm-hmm. manner that almost makes you feel even more insecure in some ways. You know what I mean? If somebody just says Mm -hmm. something, you know what they're talking about, but if it's never directly said, but it's hinted at, it leaves you to wonder about a lot. And um, I really drank that Kool-Aid. You know, I was not Mm -hmm. planning on having children. I was not planning on getting married. These were not things that were gonna be happening in my life. I was an artist. I was living in a really crappy place in Brooklyn and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that was going to uh-huh. be, you know, my, my future and suffering for whatever. I don't know. I was doing, you know, really living quote unquote, that lifestyle. And, you know, I had this moment where I was like, I'm fucking miserable, you know, like uh-huh. this is hard. And, um, I don't have health insurance. I don't have these things. I just, I really need to take a moment and, um, 
re-examine my life and what I'm doing. And the way mm. I actually did that, which which led to um, getting married and having a mother was, uh, or becoming a mother, was um, I decided I was gonna work on uh, a organic farm in Asheville of all places. <laughs> so amazing. If y'all don't know who are listening, I'm, I'm living in Asheville, speaking to Erica from Asheville. I love Asheville. I love Asheville. I went and started working on this organic farm. I was like, I'm going to figure myself out. I've got to get out of the New York art world. I need to get some skills. Nobody's hired mm -hmm. me. I don't know what to do. So I did that. Mm -hmm. And because I was out of the city and not in that kind of grind that I normally was in, um, I ended up checking and uh, receiving an email from, from somebody who wanted me to apply for a job at University of Michigan. And it was like stability. Like here I went into, un like, I was like, I'm just gonna yeah. throw it all out and go live on an organic farm. I was living with like anarchists, no joke, <laughs> which makes sense. They're still show. here. Yeah. <laughs> They're still here. <laughs> and I go from that to getting health insurance, a job, stability at University of Michigan, working there. And it was from there, finally being able to like, have an income, finally being able to support myself, that I actually had the space to begin to think of a future. Because I think when you are an artist and you're in the middle of everything and you just really want to make paintings, but you don't have any money and you're struggling and there's so many people having success around you, it's hard to get your eyes up enough to actually start to plan for the future and look forward. And so, mm. You know, University of Michigan allowed me to keep making paintings to lift my head up and think, oh my gosh, I actually do want to have children. I do want to get married. And so I mm -hmm. did these things and it was um, yet another cliff to jump off of, another wilderness, another <laughs> land to go into because I didn't yeah. know any other artists who were doing this. Um, there are artists doing it, of course. but There are too. I know. I felt like I was the only artist in the world who was yep. pregnant when I got pregnant. Yep. Yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, nobody, nobody talked about it. It was, you know, and, and I've listened to interviews even just like eight years ago where, uh -huh. you know, women did not want to talk about that. And they were told not to talk about it at their openings or anything else, you know, yeah. which I, you know, it's, just, it's crazy. But, um, so I started trying to find other women artists who were doing these kind of things, which is actually what led to Musa Collective. I really felt like I needed community. Oh. I felt like I needed people. I felt, I felt scared, you know? Um, yeah. And so the way I think I deal with being scared sometimes is through action and gathering people who I feel like can support and also guide me. Um, and so that, that's what I did. We started that space and my career has only gotten better since having children. That's so awesome. <laughs> I've gotten better. I mean, not that you have to have children for these things to happen, but for me personally, um, that's been my my story. That's so wonderful. And how encouraging to, I mean, I hope that there are young people, women, non-binary, um, who are listening to this and feeling like seeing that like, we're still here it's 20 fucking years later. We both yep. got kids and like our careers are better than they were. So, oh yeah, it does take some real strength to go against those voices though. And to really take a critical eye. And I'm really glad to hear that you had that like sense of getting out of the grind and because it, you can't do anything when you're in that incredibly restricted space. Yeah. And it's like, you know, I wasn't even really making that good of paintings at that moment either, you know, yeah. because I just, I didn't have the bandwidth because I was struggling so much to exist, yeah. you know? And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, I think all those things when you can line them up and I know it's, it's hard. I mean, I was there, <laughs> I was there living yeah. with the anarchists, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, but, uh, you, you do need to somehow shift yourself into that spot and I think it's it becomes hard to do mostly when you uh, move to an area or a city where you, you really want to be, and there's this pressure to be there, but you don't have the finances to be there. Um, we you just have to you have to listen to yourself and do what's necessary to um, protect your well being and and to move forward. Absolutely. God, I couldn't agree with that more. I, I can't tell you the number of 
people, friends of mine who, whose careers, who were living in big, expensive cities. And of course, some city time is really key when you're an artist because you want, first of all, to be at the shows and to like network and meet people and have studio visits, but it's really expensive to live there. And it's harder to have the freedom to make adventurous work when you have to grind so hard to make your rent. Right. Mm -hmm. And I have had so many friends who lived in big, expensive cities move to more rural areas or more inexpensive city, smaller cities, and their careers exploded. <laughs> like this is a pattern. Um, I'm totally a part of it. <laughs> both, both you and I, right? I mean, it's like, totally. it's amazing because you work so hard. You're a hard worker. I'm a hard worker. Artists are hard workers. So then yes. you give them just a little bit of room and amazing things happen. You know, it's, Absolutely. it's really incredible. I also think like, I've told this to younger artists before, like, don't be scared of being the weirdo. Being the weirdo can be your calling card. Like when you're in New York, nobody wants to talk to you because you're from New York. And actually, if you come visit New York from Indiana, from North Carolina, you're suddenly kind of interesting. <laughs> and like, you're like, I've been, I was living for a decade in Brooklyn and you didn't talk to me then, but now that I'm coming and I'm a North Carolina artist, <laughs> like, Oh, what's going on with her? Yeah, like what, <laughs> so. so what's, what's that like, you know? And, yeah. um, it, it's true. I think it's, I think you really hit the nail here, which is being the weirdo or living your truth and following your path is really mm -hmm. important and so hard to do. And it's true of your work and it's true of your life, you know, um, and they're so intertwined, but it's it's so hard to do. And I feel like I've just started doing it over the fi past five years. You know what I mean? Like really uh. listening and following that um, because it's hard, it's hard, but the benefits I are love huge. <laughs> the benefits are infinite. <laughs> yeah, yep. agreed. Yep. You're also, <laughs> I'm also connecting like, um, your sort of generosity of spirit and you're connecting other people and lifting other people up and creating opportunities with this idea of living your own truth. Like, I think your instincts were there. Your instincts were good. Um, <laughs> just yeah, I, it's, I have this deep love of connecting people and I've just discovered it's something mm. like innate that's just been there. It's like, Aww how my brain works. I'm like, oh, you're in Asheville doing this. You need to know so-and-so and so-and-so and let's do this, you know? <laughs> and I find it um, oh, thrilling and exciting and it gets me motivated, you know? Um, so yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. I love it. Um, so I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about, um, first of all, your, your podcast. What a phenomenon. Your podcast is amazing. If, if you're listening and you haven't heard the I Like Your Work podcast, you should. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, but what made you want to start it? How did you decide to start a podcast? Yeah, so I mentioned that I had my daughter and I was in Boston. And we started, me and some friends started Musa Collective, which is still running in Boston right now. Um, and it came out of this idea of community connection, being able to show our work, have conversations. And I loved it. Like, it was just, it was a wonderful experience. And after about a year and a half of doing that, I knew that I was going to move. I knew I wanted to mm -hmm. move back to my home state to be close to family, um, to have a little bit more space, etc. And as I was getting ready to move, I just kept thinking like, okay, I've loved this experience with Musa Collective. Like, how can I do something else like this? And mm -hmm. um, I had a lot of different ideas. <laughs> But I was uh, listening to podcasts a lot when I was painting, and originally my idea was to start like an art blog, you know, but my imposter syndrome really acted up there and I was like, I'm not a good enough writer to have an art blog. And I thought, but I love visiting studios and talking to artists about their work and I feel very confident speaking. So uh -huh. podcast. <laughs> so I just started it and it's the crazy part is is i started it right as we were leaving boston and we were relocating to ohio and we didn't have a house or anything and we were staying with my mom and it was so packed and i would go out to our van to record 
the huh. episodes. And so in the very early episodes, you can actually hear um, acorns hitting the top of the van. <gasps> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Oh my god. Yeah. yeah, I was like out there in an interview and I was like, oh my god, I mean it's so loud. And I had no idea. And I just had to like keep going through it, you know, to finish yeah. an interview and everything. But I thought, someday I hope this is a good story. <laughs> but you don't know. You don't know when you start something where it's gonna go, you know. Um yeah. I had no idea how I like your work would grow. And it has been such a, a, a wonderful space for me to connect with people. And I feel like it's such a blessing and I feel so incredibly fortunate um, to be able to have conversations with artists whose work I, I truly do love. And I'm genuinely interested in who they are. And the fact that other people enjoy hearing those conversations and learn from them. And mm -hmm. um, that's really where it started to take off, where people were writing to me about how they were using it in their um, their classrooms, you know, in college and these types of things, or, or not to feel lonely in a studio, which is what I envision, people in their studio wanting to hear from other artists. Yeah. Um, and so that's really how it started, you know, and it's just been wow. a ride since then. <laughs> so what what have you learned? Mm -hmm. I think one of the, there's a couple of different things. There's a couple of different areas. I feel like I've really grown. Um, one is about believing in yourself and not knowing where something's going to go. Like I mentioned uh -huh. earlier and, um, staying after it and believing in yourself. Uh, and the other has to do with painting, you know, so, and they're, they're actually kind of similar in a way. And it seems to be a thread that's running through this conversation, I think. Um, but what I learned just about really following something through is mm -hmm. that nobody is going to create things for you. You know, um, we have to put in that work and that time and, it doesn't have to be a punishing way. It could be a fun way. Like you can have fun with the things that you're creating and keep it interesting and light and an experiment. Mostly now with, with the internet, it's kind of like this wild west of people creating spaces and podcasts and whatever they can think of. And I mm -hmm. think when you lean into that enjoyment is when I can continue being creative and thinking up new things. <clears throat> and that's what I've discovered. I, I, I really love about the podcast is coming up with new ideas of ways we can um, serve artists, ways that we can uh, build relationships, you know, through meetups or through parties or, you know, through our membership, just different ways of connecting with people. Um, and I've also learned I'm a terrible editor. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you learn the things you're not good at too, right? And that's a beautiful thing, you know, to understand yeah. the things that you're not good at. And it does not mean you're a bad person or that I need to go become a better, like better in that area. It just means, okay, that's somebody else's wheelhouse. And there's somebody else mm -hmm. that's amazing and loves doing that. Let that go. Focus on your thing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing in terms of interviewing so many artists and hearing you know really really vulnerable stories as well you know mm -hmm. is that we're all really going through the same thing in a lot of ways which is hardships um which is imposter syndrome which is mm -hmm. learning to believe in yourself um and finally getting to a point where you trust the work because i think when you trust the work is when you make great work and when things explode for you. But it's hard to do because you have yeah. to like let it do its thing. And you might have an idea of where you want it to go. Like, oh, I want it to be here because I saw this or this is what I'm thinking. But mm -hmm. you have to let it lead in a way because that's where things are really coming through you. And those are the really powerful, powerful parts of it. So like trusting that. Um, so the threads that I was talking about in both of these areas, it really comes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is um, believing in, and trusting in yourself for your own path, the own, your own thing that you were created to do. Yeah. I love that. It's funny as you're talking about this, your podcast, you could have been talking about making paintings. It's so, so similar. 
right? <laughs> Painting's life. It's life. <laughs> <laughs> Painting is life. Um, yeah. Yeah. I find that really, really fascinating. It, it, it honestly is one of the pleasures of getting older. Um, like I, I love being a painter who's been working for 20 years at this point. Honestly, I'm starting to love being a business owner who's been in business for what, eight years. <laughs> oh, I applaud that. I can't wait to hit that point as well. But it's, it's scary Thank at you. first, right? Like even being a painter was hard. Like what so am scary. I doing here? You know, business owner, mm -hmm. I feel like I'm in the middle of that. Um, for so many of us people listening, you know, um, you may not have a background in business. Hannah and I did not, mm -hmm. you know? And so it's kind of, if I can keep it exciting. You might have an anti background, yes. <laughs> which is oh what I, I feel like I had. <laughs> That's me too. Which is why <laughs> Hannah and I have always gotten along so well. Cause I can be like, oh my God, you know what I'm thinking here. <laughs> um, yeah. An anti background. And I still struggle against it. You know, I mean, yeah. it's really crazy. The patterns that are created in our youth that we have to figure out ways to break, to be the people we need to be, you know? Absolutely. But I think that trust is really important. Like it is so freaking scary when you start anything, right? Painting is scary. Uh, have you ever talked to an art historian who's like absolutely terrified of trying their own hand at art? I mean, like <laughs> That no, is an epidemic. Happened. That's a secret <laughs> epidemic out there. I and didn't like, know that. That's so interesting. I didn't. Oh, just that. pay attention when you talk yeah. to people. Like, because yeah. most programs, you know, like when you're in art history programs, you have to take some studio art and just talk to people who have like an art history degree about their studio art experience. So you'll <laughs> you'll hear some stories. You'll hear <laughs> their imposter syndrome coming out. But but I'm always like. But that's how you start. Like you have to be terrible at it at first. Like that, that's actually how it starts. You can't be good until you've been terrible for a little while. And doesn't that take the pressure off? You know, it's yes. like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I don't know how to do this yet, but I'm mm -hmm. just beginning. How would I know, you know? Yeah. And um, we all start out terrible. <laughs> and yeah, that's, there's a comfort in that, you know? <laughs> for sure. For sure. But I also love, like, I think one of that rich zones to me is like that, um, when you can trust fall into it, when you've been doing it long enough that, you know, it's going to find you again, like this weird thing I'm doing. And I don't know why. And literally I could be talking about podcasting business or painting right now. doesn't even matter this weird thing I'm doing right now. And I don't know why there is a reason inside of you and just give it some time and keep going. And it, the reason will come out. It'll oh, reveal itself. Yes, Hannah. I love that you say that because it's so true. And like you said, in all facets, like there's mm -hmm. stuff in my paintings that I just discovered I was doing in grad school. And I'm like, oh my God, I forgot about that painting, but here it's coming back. And then also when I was coming out of grad school, I kept trying to create something like this and I, I didn't think about it. Like I created mm -hmm. these zines. Um, I actually did do a couple artist interviews that were done verbally that, that I then transcribed and would put in these zines and publications. And oh, wow. um, yeah, and they never took off, you know, maybe it mm -hmm. wasn't my time, I don't know. But like you said, these things, they just keep coming back. I always mention um, something that Stanley Lewis told me when I was at Chautauqua, which is you're gonna spend the rest of your career uh, remembering things you already learned. And I mm. always think of that. I think of it all the time in all parts of my life. I feel like, oh yeah, I, I remember that. Like, you know, but you, you come back to it, you know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> Boy, parenting loops into this conversation, oh, doesn't it? Like, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> Wait a minute. My mother's voice just came out through my mouth. <laughs> right? And I'm like, oh, how is this happening? But it does, you know, it does. I see why she harped on certain things for me now. And I'm like, oh, yep. I get, oh, I get it. it. I get it. <laughs> I know it's like, as you move through life, you just have more wisdom and you can revisit things that were said to you. You didn't understand at the time. They have yeah. totally new meaning. Yeah. 
And that's such a beautiful thing because it means we're constantly learning and evolving and changing because otherwise life mm -hmm. would be so boring. You know, <laughs> I, I used to think that I wanted to be exactly the same, you know, when I was 22 years old. I don't want to ever change. I'm like this artist. I'm doing these things. Da, 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 da. Thank God I changed. <laughs> oh, man. You couldn't pay me to be in my 20s again. Oh, I mean, me either. I missed that butt. I missed that butt. But... <laughs> besides oh, that <laughs> oh, the brain I wouldn't trade for anything no, no. <laughs> oh my god so um I'm really curious like I want to talk about we touched a little bit on like entrepreneurship and starting into business and I know that you're kind of entering a little bit of new territory with this membership you've created I want you to talk to me a little bit about why you decided to create a membership. And I want, and then let's, this can range around. Cause I also want to talk about just like what you're seeing in the art world. What are you responding to? What, like, what's the why behind it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I was really excited to start a membership because I love connecting with people and I love serving people to a certain extent and like sharing my knowledge. It's one of the things mm -hmm. I, I enjoy doing. So I'm like, oh my gosh, we're going to do a membership. Um, and wow, has it been an experience, a new experience? Um, uh -huh. Because the big thing I think I've learned as an entrepreneur is that for me, it's easy to have ideas and I have a lot of knowledge um, from painting, from my MFA, from working in New York, from running the podcast, open calls, you know, curation, all these things. And I want to share it. And that's that's easy for me to do that, to, mm -hmm. to write that part. The hard part is um, making sure everything <clears throat> functions online in a certain way where people can have access to it. And I think this is true of of all a lot of endeavors, anything you're going to be doing like a podcast, you know, you're yeah. listening to this podcast, but there's a lot of moving parts behind it, like scheduling, um, having a good calendar that's working with that, having uh, the editing software, having it get up online, having the show, you know, all these parts. Mm -hmm. And for me in the membership <clears throat> and in general, just for anybody who's thinking about going into becoming an entrepreneur or creating something, which I highly suggest you do, is to know that um, you're not alone and being like, oh my God, <laughs> let's get all this software and everything to work together, you know, yeah. because you're learning a lot of different languages to put together. But um, in terms of building the membership, yeah, it goes back to like, wow, I have a lot of information that I wish I would have had when I was a younger artist. Nobody talked about certain things. This information wasn't out there. And I still have conversations with mid-career artists um, mm -hmm. and artists who are older, you know, than myself, who have questions about these different parts of being an artist, because we mm -hmm. all learned how to paint, we all learned how to make whatever, we all learned how to do that. But like you said, we didn't learn the business end. And yeah. that is just shooting ourselves in the foot, not to understand these things, not to understand how to, to run your studio professionally, um, mm -hmm. or having your materials organized. So, so those are all the things that I started covering in the membership. And it really starts uh, from a point and moves up, which I start with organizing materials, because that was one of the biggest things um, working in other artist studios that I noticed was they have a really great system for keeping everything together. And most artists I know don't have that. Um, oh, fascinating. You know, you know like yeah. artists who are established or doing well have that. But these mm -hmm. younger artists who are like, I want a gallery, I want to do this, I want to do that. And I was that artist at one time. Yeah. They're like, don't know how to put it all together so that it's easy to apply to these things. So that's where we start. We talk about photographing work. We talk about artist statements, um, a lot of really great stuff, again, as a way to serve artists and build communities so that people can share opportunities. I think that's another big thing that um, we need as artists is like a cohort, if you will, of people mm -hmm. you can talk to about your work and also um, share opportunities because we're only one person. And when you're doing social media and you're doing your website and you're trying to apply and you're making the work itself, that's really overwhelming. So like, how can we shift some of that so that you don't have to do it all? And, that, and that's why I also have templates where people can like 
you know, okay, you want to update your CV and maybe it looks kind of bad. Here's some templates you can use. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with like uh, downloading the, the Google Drive system that I use to organize everything. You can download that and use it. It's all there laid out for you. I've done that work so you don't have to because why should you do that? I'd rather see your paintings. <laughs> love that. I love that. So you're helping people kind of refocus back on their studio time and what they do well by helping share the resources on the hard stuff, the organizational stuff. Yeah. Yep. All of those good things. And even also just how to reach out, like mm -hmm. how do you reach out to a podcaster or a space or somebody who's running a magazine? Like how do mm -hmm. you approach press? Um, and these were things that I really learned from running. I like your work and having our open calls and jurying mm -hmm. for other spaces. It's like, I've now been on the other side. So I want to share that information with people. That's awesome. So valuable. So tell me, I'm just curious, like, because you've been running the, I like your work podcast and gathering all these skills for a long time. Now, I, I'm curious what you've seen in the art world. Have things changed? What, like, what are you seeing people struggle with now? Yeah. You know, I was actually just writing about this this morning. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so one thing I've really noticed is it's wonderful that we have so many opportunities to show our work and be engaged via a space like this, like a podcast or online or on Instagram. It's incredible. It's been a game changer. It's amazing the, you know, before you had to go to an actual gallery space to talk to someone, to make a con connection. So maybe they'd show your work, but now front doors are all around you. You just have to jump online and there is a front door to a gallery you know what i mean and you could start engaging mm -hmm. it's crazy that being said the flip of this is that there are no rules surrounding any of this there are no boundaries surrounding any of this um and what that means is it can spiral into this burnout of constantly trying to interact, constantly trying to get your work out there or totally avoiding it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And we need to find this middle ground as artists so that we have a healthy space to exist online with our work, connecting, et cetera, having those boundaries set up um, and then having being able to get into the studio without these things overlapping too much. Because otherwise it's just, it's people burn out. There's so many opportunities out there. I mean, you could just sit there and apply to stuff all day long or update your website all day long. You know, like there's so many things yeah. you have to figure out how to put stops on it. So I think that's what artists are, are struggling with is um, that, and then everything's always evolving. So, you know, like artists really got a handle on posting images on Instagram and like, okay, I got my grid and I got this. And then there's reels, you know, remember Instagram mm -hmm. TV, like what happened with that? You know, people are yeah. trying to learn these new tools and then they're taken away or they learn it. And then a new one is implemented and that's going to continue on. And, um, I think a lot of people struggle with that as well. Like, okay, well, what's, what's, how am I supposed to do this? What's the point? How am I, I feel behind? And it causes that imposter syndrome to really rear its ugly head again, you know, and that leaks into our studio. So boundaries, 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 I think are huge. It's something I'm really all about. Um, and I think as an entrepreneur, and you would probably agree, or somebody who's running a business, you uh -huh. have to have these boundaries set up or chaos ensues, you know? Oh my God. I couldn't do anything without them. In fact, I get emails on the regular from artists saying how much they appreciate me upholding boundaries that it gives them permission to do it in their own life. That's amazing. Um, and I, I found like, for me, there was a funny, um, starting a business really highlighted ways that I wanted to have boundaries that I found a little harder to uphold in art than I did in tax work, you know, but actually once I realized that I could, I brought them back over to, to art. So like, for example, when you're doing somebody's tax, I, I just made a policy of like, I'm not going to like do friends and family discounts because mm -hmm. everyone who's going to come in the door is going to be a friend in some way or another. <laughs> so yeah. like, I have ways that I can be generous to people. I have like personal relationships with, but they don't involve like discounting. Um, and that's been a big one for me. And honestly, if I didn't do it, 
I'd be kind of in a rough spot when you, you know, interact 100% with friends. I, I think this is a really, really big topic. And I feel like we could talk about it for like a million podcasts, but Absolutely. We, we've discussed this toxic kind of background that a lot of artists have with money. And mm-hmm. then, you know, the space that we're really entering, you know, and I feel like I always think of Michelle Grabner. She, you know, she was like a painter curator um, and one of the first people kind of opening this path to wearing a lot of hats that was being accepted professionally. Mm-hmm. And now there's more and more people doing that. <clears throat> Thank God. Yeah. I mean, I think it's it's wonderful. But what starts to happen is these people, myself included, you start something like this, you have this toxic money background and um, a lack of boundaries, not because there's something wrong, but just because you never had to have them in place before because you weren't yeah. doing this type of work. And it becomes this big storm of like, well, is this space going to stay open or is this you know thing going to continue on and for me it's been really hard to um, address those things but i've had to and i'm continually having to do it in order to let the podcast and and our catalogs continue on you know what i mean totally yeah man yeah i really relate to that um i i feel like you know there's some ways in which i think about this a lot like artists um when you sell paintings like we both do, um, y- you might, you know, you're, you're lucky. It's a good year if you sell 15 paintings. Right. Mm-hmm. And, um, I mean, for me, that's maybe a really good year. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great year, Hannah. Can I have your year? <laughs> um, but so you just don't have that many interactions. Whereas like for me, like in, in tax work and my program that I run, like I have hundreds of people who I'm interacting with pretty constantly. So, you know, like if somebody were to ask for a refund for a painting, it would kill me. It would kill me. It actually wouldn't kill me, but I feel like it would kill me. Right. And I know that you can relate to that, but like in running a business where you interact with people and the touch point is a little lighter than a, you know, $10,000 painting, Mm -hmm. um, People will ask for refunds. In fact, if you just go out and ask literally any business owner, every single one of them has refund requests. Like it is just a policy you have to have. You have to put it in your contract. You have to have a policy. You have to enforce it. And also it's not even enough to just write it down and say, this is my policy. You have to enforce it. You have to tell them, you have to be like, you have to explain it. You have to uphold it. And um, I think like, it's really hard to come to the realization like, oh, this is a thing I'm going to have to handle. This just exists. This is a cost of doing business and not a personal failure, you know? So I think it can be hard to transition into business or even honestly difficult interactions in the art world because you don't have them very much. You just do not have this repetition where you get to practice like, oh, okay, I need to say up front every time. I just want you to know this is my refund policy, you know? <laughs> Oh my gosh, there's so much goodness in there, Hannah. I'm gonna like listen to that part of this podcast over and over again because it's so <laughs> true. Like uh, a couple of things like really just lit up for me. The last part yeah. you were saying about repetition, you know, just I think anytime you're trying something new, like we said, you're never good at it, but the mm-hmm. repetition makes you better and better and better. And then it doesn't yes. sing as much. You know what I mean? And you get like you understand yes. it, you see what's coming. Mm-hmm. And um Yes. Like I remember somebody at BU saying every opportunity you get to speak about your work, take it because the first, Mm -hmm. however many are going to be probably pretty bad, but it gives you the experience and you, you, you have to have the experience. You have to do the thing. You can't just read about the thing. You've got to do it and experience it. And that is what teaches you. And then you can handle it a lot better, you know, and, um, That that's just so good, Hannah. Oh, I love it. (laughs) (laughs) I think about that, that one so often, because these things would kill me when they happened in my studio. And now they happen all the freaking time. It's not that I thought, oh, the world will be a better place when no one's ever mad at me, when nobody ever has an unpleasant interaction with me. And now I run a business. I'm like, oh, I just have to learn how to deal with it when people are mad at me. (laughs) 
Like it's I not know. that <laughs> my life isn't going to improve because this goes away. My life is going to improve because I learned how to deal with this that exists. <laughs> I just needed to hear that myself, Hannah, like right now. Oh, that God. was so good. I love it. And it's true. Like I keep yeah. picturing my first, um, uh, when I started an email list, which I never wanted to do, this was years ago. And oh. that was like a hard step. And then I got my first unsubscribe and I was like, oh my God, you know, I was like bummed <laughs> out. And now I get them like all the time. And I mean, I don't yes. you know, it's just life. But th that first time. <sighs> be really hard mm -hmm. in anything but you you live oh you live through it doesn't kill you you move on You're yeah <laughs> on such email and subscribes are probably the first stepping stone that probably artists have this experience of seeing people unsubscribe please just a psa to all of you listening please stop getting alerts for your unsubscribes just ignore it yeah, like it exists it's so fine. true oh my god you don't need to huge. you don't need to dwell in that huge you don't need to know you don't need to know it's not going to make you feel better oh my gosh yeah. my friend ended up uh she runs a business and she was able to see who stopped following her on instagram totally mm -hmm. screwed up her week you know like oh she god was, i don't so, look i don't, don't look. check don't check <laughs> no <laughs> never never look at that why would you do it that's like saying i hate myself and i'd really rather not get anything productive done today <laughs> you want to wallow you want some netflix and some ice cream and chill out uh -huh. yeah no no don't do it <laughs> Ooh, i prefer to wallow without a pit in my stomach oh right right oh, oh my god <laughs> yeah Amazing. So I, let me, let me pull this out. I could talk about this for ever. Oh my God. We have to have another, well, let's have a follow-up in a couple months where we talk about entrepreneurship, that. art lessons <laughs> and art entrepreneurs. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but I want to, so I just want to ask you a couple more questions. I'm curious about, you know, frankly, selfishly, I'm curious about people like me, like mm -hmm the old people who feel, you know, I'm mid career. I think I finally graduated out of emerging and I'm <laughs> mid career. I love it. Um, and I'm just curious because you, you've said this to me once, I hope it's okay to say it out loud here, but that you are really good at bridging sort of what's going on, what's fresh, what newbies in the art world are going through and experiencing. And then what, what olds like me, what the mid career <laughs> artists are doing. <laughs> like, can you uh, talk to me about that? Yeah. Yeah. I would love to. And Hannah, you were not old. Okay. At all. And, um, yeah, I'm could... proudly in my fuck you forties and I would not trade it for the world. <laughs> I'm entering, I'm entering this year very soon. I'm very excited about it. Um, nice. I think it's going to be a, a spectacular decade, you know, and beyond, but Absolutely. yeah, it was actually an artist who brought this up to me and I hadn't thought of it this way or seen it this way, but she is in her forties, you know, and mm -hmm. she's like what a gen Xer. And uh -huh. she was saying that I technically my age and where I'm at is like a geriatric millennial. <laughs> oh God. Oh, <laughs> who came I up know. with that? Oh, I know. Right. She's like, it's terrible. This is such a terrible name, but you know, okay. I'm, I'm like right in between like Gen Xers and that's many and most of my friends and um, millennials, you know, like I'm right there on the edge. And so my digital landscape and um, experience growing up was just different enough from my Gen Xer friend who was bringing this up that mm -hmm. I'm able to kind of bridge these two worlds in a way that I can explain, um, like for example, I'm teaching something on reels right now to um, an area of people who are like, I don't know anything about this. I feel like I should mm -hmm. know something about it. And I'm like, well, I know some because I'm just, I'm working on it and doing this, but, um, I can I can take what's happening here and for those people that can't obviously see this I'm motioning to millennials to the <laughs> other um, as she described it the the bitter she was like you know I'm bitterly smoking my cigarette in the corner you know yeah. <laughs> like that generation and I feel that I am that. Yeah. Um, but I yeah. can also speak to like this younger generation I try to it's getting harder I'm noticing each year. Um, 
in a digital format and a digital landscape. And when mm -hmm. she mentioned all of this, I thought, oh my God, because a lot of people that I work with are in their 50s, 60s, 40s, you know, and they're asking for help on things that um, millennials are just have done their whole life. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so that was a really cool uh, thing to think about, you know, and a way to serve and help and like, I don't know. Um, yeah. Just share knowledge. I love it. Is your, is your membership program, um, geared towards one or the other of those groups particularly? It's not, it's not geared towards one or the other, but I definitely have both. I, I feel like the membership where it's really serving people, it's serving people who are like getting out of grad school and, um, had a wonderful experience painting or making, but didn't learn any of the other things. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. they, they didn't learn how to put together these materials in a way or how to approach a space or, or any of that, which I did not learn in grad school. You know, I painted my ass off for two years and it was wonderful, but I came out having to learn all this stuff in embarrassing ways <laughs> by failing, you know? <laughs> oh God. Yes. So much embarrassment. Yes. I'm right there with you. <laughs> yeah. So I help artists like that. And then artists who are older, who are like, okay, I want to do this. Like I'm ready to do this. How mm -hmm. do I do this? <laughs> you know, and yeah. they have a background, but they're just not sure how to move forward. Um, yeah. So yeah, that those are the two spaces that I feel like I, I serve really well. That's fantastic. Very cool. So if people want to um, check out your membership, where should they go, Erica? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you can go to uh, theworksmembership.com. Uh, it's linked through our other website, which is I Like Your Work podcast. You can go into our Instagram bio and find it there. Uh, we only open the doors during specific times of the year so that we can really try and serve uh, the artists that are coming in. So you can get on a wait list if it is not open, but we will be launching when um, right after season five of I Like Your Work goes live. So keep your ears and eyes open. <laughs> Fantastic. So we're talking, we're speaking in, as we're talking right now, it's July, but this episode is going to drop when my podcast debuts for the first time. And you Ooh. and I are doing a little event together, aren't we? Yes, we are. <laughs> Let's talk you about that. It is going to be fabulous. I am so excited. So we are going to be co-hosting a panel at Piano Craft Gallery in Boston, Massachusetts, and it is going to be basically a big party. So it's going to be part of the I Like Your Work uh, fall exhibition. So there's going to be an opening. I'm curating the show. I'm going to give a gallery talk and tour. There's going to be um, music, food, drinks, as long as COVID doesn't interfere with anything again. And um, it, it's just fantastic. Last year was our first year to do a launch party and it was at Piano Craft Gallery and it was during COVID. So everybody was masked and we didn't have any food or drinks, no, no wine or anything like you would normally have. And it was so fun. <laughs> like <laughs> I couldn't believe how yeah. fun it was, you know, and yeah. I just looked up and saw all these amazing artists, all this amazing artwork. It was just this, this energy, this positive energy of people being there together and supporting one another. It is such a fun time. So I hope that you guys will come out to the opening. It'll be September 2nd uh, at Piano Craft Gallery in Boston. And Hannah and I are going to be talking and lots of artwork. It's a good time. <laughs> it's going to be great. It's going to yeah. be great. I'm so excited. Yeah, Erica, it has been such a pleasure talking to you. Um, I could talk to you forever and I would love to have you back. So let's have a revisit. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so, so much. Um, all the resources we mentioned will be in the show notes for you. Um, and so definitely do check out Erica's membership. And if you have not listened to the, I like your work podcast, it is a great studio listen. So definitely check it out. Thank Erica, you thank so you much, so much Anna. for being here. It's oh. been a blast. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Awesome. Awesome. Take care. Bye.